Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to day number 47 of the Israel's war with the Gazan terrorists. Um, we started on the 7th of October, as we all know, and uh, um, and it's been going on since then. It started with a massacre of uh, 1,200, 1,300 people. We're still not sure of the exact number and uh, of the kidnapping, taking hostage of 240 people. That's what we're going to devote today's section to. Um because of really the dramatic uh, developments of the last uh, 24 hours. I'm uh, uh, joined today by uh, uh, my colleague and uh, Jerusalem uh, uh, Center uh, uh, scholar, uh, um, uh, Professor Erwin Mansdorf. And with uh, joining us from Rome today is our uh, is the JCAPA uh, president, uh, Dan Dyker. Um, hi, Dan. Welcome. Welcome, Erwin. And um, what I'm going to do just uh, uh, to start off, as we always do, it's just give the, the, the brief rundown of where we are, where we got to. We're going to make it short today because we have a lot to unpack um, and there isn't so much going on. In Gaza, the IDF forces are continuing to attack and destroy um, the Hamas and other terrorist sites. In the north, uh, uh, sorry, well, just before we run on, in the south, the Gazan terrorists are continuing to shoot rockets and mortars towards Israel's civilian population. We had a barrage yesterday afternoon and another uh, a barrage this morning. Um, moving up quickly to the north, the war of attrition with Hezbollah is continuing on. Um, Hezbollah keeps on shooting at us. We keep on shooting back. Sometimes we destroy all of the terrorists. Sometimes we destroy some of the terrorists. Sometimes we destroy some of their uh, um, sites along the border. Um, wider than that, in Judea and Samaria and in uh, uh, um and in Israel, there isn't anything new or different to uh, um, to report. So we'll quickly move on. And also in that wider environment, um, no no more developments from yesterday um, from the the Houthi, um, No more no more missiles being shot at us. No more boats that we know um, being uh, um, uh, uh, the subject of piracy. Um, so that's the update on the those subjects. And so. That brings us straight into our, our, our subject of today. Um, for those of you who have been following, um, I'm sure you will have heard that last night, Israel's uh, government decided to approve a deal that will bring about the release, hopefully, of 100 of the hostages being held by the terrorists in Gaza. Um, the deal is that Israel will agree to release up to 300 terrorists who have been held in prison um, on the one hand, on the other hand, it will give, for the first part of the deal, 50 hostages being released, 150 terrorists being released. Israel will also give four days of ceasefire um, to, uh, uh, um, to Gaza. And there are all types of reports of other deals and other uh, um, ingredients or parts of the deal. We can't say for sure exactly what they are. Um, we can only give 100% information based on the publicly published um, information by the government. The other the other uh, uh, um, parts that have been discussed that Israel will allow the entry of fuel, of humanitarian support um, to the south and uh, uh, um, much less, uh, uh, it would appear, supervision of it going in. Um, on the one hand, there was a report from a uh, an Israeli journalist who, of, who is of reputable nature, of course, um, who said that Israel had also agreed to stop any reconnaissance flights over the southern area of the Gaza Strip for at least six hours a day during every day of the ceasefire. Um, again, I have to just stress these are ingredients that we can't 100% uh, uh, um, certify, but those are things that have been uh, reported. So what we're going to talk about today, um, uh, uh, that's the, uh, really the, 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 the subject. How do you deal with terrorist organizations holding hostages? What price can you or should you pay? Um, what is a high price? What is a low price? I know that for the, the, the families of the hostages being released, some of them would say any price we, could, we should pay, it's not too high. Others would say we don't want to pay any price because we fear that as a result of the release, other people um, might die. Any any position in the middle is probably a legitimate position. Um, but what we're going to discuss today is really how terrorist organizations 
manipulate the reality, manipulate Western societies and civilizations into forcing them to make these, these really biblical decisions as to what to do. How do you bring about the release of nine-month-old Kfir Bibas and, uh, and, and 85-year-old hostages? What prices are you willing to pay? Um, who puts you in those situations to start with? Um, so that's what we're going to discuss today. Um, Dan, if you want to give up uh, just a, a, a quick update from, from Rome and, uh, and, 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 and what you're hearing from, from Rome about this decision, um, that would also be, uh, I think, uh, quite helpful. Thank you very much, Maurice, and delighted to see Dr. Owen Mansdorf back again to help us understand the psychological warfare uh, aspect of wh where we are. I think uh, your pressy uh, brief, uh, Maurice, is uh, right to the point and very much on message here, uh, where the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs is here in Rome. We're about to co-host tomorrow morning the first ever, uh, the first ever uh, assembly or emergency summit with the Italian Senate on the a spiking uh, global and anti genocidal anti-Semitism. Uh, and this is the first parliament in the free world that has taken a stand and has agreed to co-host uh, such an assembly uh, about uh, uh, the not only the spike in global uh, genocidal anti-Semitism, beginning with the Hamas, extending to the uh, to Judea and Samaria under the Palestinian Authority areas. Uh, Maurice, you wrote uh, an, a very important article that is either has either just come out or is about to come out about the polling that's been done in the Palestinian Authority areas that shows an overwhelming majority of the Palestinian Arab public in Judea and Samaria, on, uh, uh, the, uh, otherwise known as the former West Bank of Jordan, under PA control, um, unanimously and enthusiastically supports the Hamas in its massacre and post-massacre uh, policies and behaviors. So that uh, lends itself, uh, uh, Maurice and Irwin, to a very disturbing reality where you have, this is an issue of public enthusiasm for mass murder of Jews. Not only, it's not a political issue anymore. This is an issue of, uh, of darkness and light. This is an issue of good and evil and nothing less than that. And part of the work, I think, that needs to happen now is to begin to differentiate uh, between what has always been uh, what has always been known as a, a, a political issue. You are hearing even from Rome uh, and other uh, uh, and other uh, capitals in the West calls for what they call a two state solution, which has, in our view, absolutely nothing to do with the behavior of Hamas, with the behavior of the Palestinian Authority leadership where we are today. We've it's metastasized way beyond a, a, a political uh, a, a political conflict into a, a conflict that basically casts uh, the Jews and inside the Jewish state, outside the Jewish state as the incarnations of, of evil. We have seen this in the past. It's not something new. It's really just come to a head. So tomorrow we will be presenting um, with the help of Fiamma Nerenstein, who uh, very much was uh, our JCPA fellow uh, and um, uh, very much the driving force behind this initiative with the uh, Italian Senate. And our host here is former Foreign Minister Giulio Terzi, the former ambassador to Israel from Italy, the former Italian ambassador to the United States and to the United Nations, one of the best known diplomatic figures in Italy. Uh, he will be hosting us tomorrow morning and we will be presenting for the first time 10 principles of combating this uh, manifestation of genocidal anti-Semitism, and you'll be seeing a lot of media coverage uh, on this uh, on this issue. As we turn to uh, Dr. Erwin Mansdorf, I think that we should mention that, as Maurice said, the price that Israel has to pay here uh, in order to not only return captives, which is its own issue called Pidion Shvuim, that relates to the captives in war between warring parties. Here, there's a different situation of pikuach nefesh. As Maurice mentioned, we have, we have infants, we have toddlers, we have teens, and we have the elderly. And this, uh, this in, in, I think, in, in the view of, uh, of, of Jewish history, of Jewish morality and ethics, falls under the umbrella of saving a life, of saving life, pikuach nefesh. Uh, and we know pikuach uh, nefesh keneged kulam, it's the most important 
uh, principle in, in Judaism is saving a single life as though you've saved an entire world. Uh, but the price that we that Israel has to pay is enormously high in terms of the legitimacy that it provides to the Hamas uh, uh, terror organization internationally. That is a major price. The image uh, that it uh, uh, the, that it casts upon Israel is another issue, which I think we'll have to talk about. Uh, but it's primarily the weaponization of Hamas's internationally perceived legitimacy uh, by engaging with the terror organization in a negotiation, by allowing them to take center stage on the international um, in this international negotiation or, or internationally sanctioned negotiation is is a major, I think, a major major issue that that we have to. Uh, uh, discuss and unpack. And with this, I'll turn back to you, Maurice, and to Irwin for Irwin's assessment about the psychological warfare aspect of, of this uh, ongoing uh, and, and probable negotiation. So let me, if I may, uh, Irwin, just before uh, um, be, be, before we, we I turn to you, just to present the situation uh, to our viewers, 240 people taken hostage. No one knows what their situation is. No one knows whether they're alive, whether they're dead. How, uh, what their health situation is. We suddenly saw yesterday after the announcement uh, um, of the deal that Palestinian Islamic Jihad announced that one of its hostages died. had died. Suddenly out of nowhere. This whole thing, we, we, we saw at the beginning, four hostages almost magnanimously released without any type of payment. All of this designed really to, 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 to to influence the way that Israel is perceived, is seen, what's going on. As we as we started this broadcast, Musa Abu Marzouk, uh, um, one of the heads of, of Hamas, um, said on Al Jazeera that this first release is a promise that they will bring about the release of all of the terrorists in jail. This means people like Abdallah Barghouti, responsible for the murder of 67 people, Ibrahim Khamed, 54 people, Hassan Salama, 44 people, mass terror attacks, Americans, foreigners, everyone murdered, babies, children. There were these are the people they're trying to so 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 walk us through, what are they trying to do to us and 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 explain to us how it's working so well. So I, I think everybody agrees this is a deal that nobody wanted to make. And we didn't want to be put in a position. But you know, let's for a second dip into the mind of of Hamas, of, of a of a terror organization and of, of, a, of an Islamic terror organization, how they think. They do not think like us, they do not think like the West. And the reason they had these hostages was precisely for this moment. Horse trading. Precisely for this moment. They they have the hostages to use when they want to use them, and they're not using all of them. They're using a certain amount of them because they're not giving away all their cards. What is it that they want right now? Well, what is it that they're getting? And then you know what they want. The 150 terrorists that they're having released is really not the main, that, that's sort of like the gravy on top of what they want. What they want is they don't want war anymore. They want to end the war. And the reason they want to end the war is not because they want peace and they want some kumbaya moment of negotiating and being able to live with us. They want to stop the war now because if you stop the war now, they won. They won. They, their images increased. I mean, as you mentioned from the poll, that's uh, done in... in 75% percent, support right? for the murder. And if we take a look at, at, at other polling that, that we see around the Arab world, we see that it's consistent with that. We take a look at what's happened in the Western world. We look at the people marching in the streets of the United States and Europe. Right now, they have a wind at their back that they never had beforehand. So right now, they won. And what they want to do with the release of the hostages is not any humanitarian aspect of it. They want, with the release of the hostages, to use this time to build on making sure that the war does not renew itself again. So while we're in there for four days, I think that it's not unreasonable to think that we're going to see extensions of that. Uh, and they'll horse trade more with the rest of the people that they have. The question that we need to ask is that it ends at 100, and we know there's more than 100 there. So what happens after we get this out? Well, first of all, if all the 100 are released, we're talking about 10 days of not having a war. Yeah. 10 days of having not having a war brings up another question. It's a military question. What do we do with, with fighting forces that have 10 days that were 
in a certain momentum and all of a sudden they're stopping for 10 days? Is it so easy to renew it again? That's another question. We don't know about the intelligence gathering that's happening or not happening with this report about uh, the, the aerial um, surveillance that's left. On the, on the other hand, we are getting hostages that can supply us with information. So there's going to be intelligence information that we're going to get from the hostages if there's some sort of a glimmer of anything positive that's coming out of them. But renewing a war after stopping it is not something that's, that's so easy to do. And during that time, it's not only up to us, it's what do you think Hamas is going to do? Hamas is going to put a full blitz on stopping the war. They, we're going to see more pictures of destruction. We're going to see more comparisons of Dresden. We're going to see more civilian deaths. This is the psychological asymmetry that I've spoken about for years in terms of what they've used. They used it before, so there's no reason not to believe they're going to use it again. Uh, and this is what we're faced with. So let's say they released 100 hostages, right? And there's 10 days. And let's say we start fighting again. Why would they release any more hostages at that point, if we're already saying, if you release all the hostages, we're going to kill you. We're going to destroy yeah. you. So if you're a Hamas member and you're a Hamas leader, why would you release the other hundred hostages if you know that after release, you're a dead person? So that's part of the, of the horse trading and the thinking, and that's part of the dilemmas that we're going to face. And uh, we don't know how the next week is going to, is going to pan out if they keep to the deal. Hamas has been in situations where they, where they go back to Hadar Golden, who was kidnapped during a ceasefire. Yeah. So we don't kidnapped know- Kidnapped after they breached the ceasefire right. and right. started fighting right. again, and right. then killed Hadar and, and then right. snatched his body. And he's, and he's not part of this deal after yeah. all these years also. So we don't know what it is. No, they're, so, they're, so I have to say that from, from the point of view of the, the decision of the government, they wanted and 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 they possibly rightly gave precedence to live hostages. That's a, one of the stipulations that the hostages that be released be live hostages. Obviously, under, on the understanding that they most probably are uh, um, dead hostages, but there's precedence to that. So I I I would hope that we haven't forgotten about Hadar again, uh, um, and and that that will be maybe possibly part of some future yeah, deal. I mean, there is also, one. Should, I mean, I've, I've heard differing reports in terms of what the Red Cross involvement will be at this time, in terms of the other hostages. Uh, you know, I've heard one report that they're going to be getting medical treatment and they're going to get their medicines and who needs it. But uh, we, we still don't know how many hostages there really are there. And that's not, right. so that's something that uh, I don't know if that's one of the things that we stood on and didn't stand on. You know, as far as it is, it a good deal or a bad deal? You know, that's not not my role to to speak about that. Uh, the deal is made, uh, and what we could speak about now is what are the ramifications of the deal and what do we do about the deal. But I I can say that uh, before the deal uh, was finalized and approved by the by the full by the government, uh, one of the political parties in Israel uh, by Betal Smutrich of, um, of of the one of the so-called right-wing parties, uh, announced before he got in there that he's against the deal, but he voted for it after you heard certain information. So the certain information that was released there that obviously if, if someone like Batsal Smutrich turned around and changed his mind, there are things that we don't know. And we really have to respect it as something there that, that might be um, of importance. And that's one of the reasons that, uh, that he did change his mind. So, so as but, we but just... the ramifications are really, what are we going to do in 10 days if it really stretches out to that? What are we going to do at the end of 10 days? Now, remember, there's, there's another aspect to this. You know, we've been having uh, casualties every day. You wake up in the morning and you see that line on the TV uh, yeah. in, in Hebrew, who talib yosum, uh, Release, release, for publication. release for publication. And you know, when you see that, there's one or two or three or more uh, soldiers that, that have been killed. Um, it's going to be a relief not to see that for the next few days. And we have to ask ourselves, what will be the appetite of the Israeli public knowing that you're going to be seeing that again? I mean, you now have a break. Family as a whole, people are not worried about their families and their and their soldiers that that are, that are in Gaza. really the deal brings upon multifaceted questions for, right. for every side right. what are hamas thinking how is it how did they see the deal moving forward we know what hamas, the release of more terrorists the the, the, the ceasefire hamas, on the israeli the side more terrorists is less of an issue they don't want to warn it 
Yeah, on the they want the war stopping, to end. stopping and the war, and, and they know, and despite it. the destruction, things are going to be rebuilt. And as long as they're kept in power, that which is really what they're looking for, uh, it's a victory. They're looking to survive another day, to keep on fighting, to keep on trying to implement um, their right. their their charter, which right. calls for the the destruction of Israel. That's right. that's really yeah. their goal. Uh, yeah, I'll remind you what our friend uh, Mordechai Kedar said uh, right at the beginning of this thing: that if the war ends with one Hamas person on top of a destroyed Gaza that is left, and all he has are two fingers and he's raising it like that, then it's a victory. It's that picture of victory. Uh, um, and, and and really, they're getting that picture of victory uh, um, to, to a certain extent now, albeit limited. Um, but really, the other side of the picture is also Israel. How Israel is going to be able to deal with the, the hostage release. Um, as you said, one side is, well, what will be the appetite to carry on fighting after eight days, ten what's days? What's going of, to happen with of, all the of, terrorists of, that are not released into Gaza? These terrorists are released back home. What's happening into the very areas of Judea and Samaria where, where they, they and, could, where they could make and, even and Jerusalem. By the way, there, there there are a lot of the terrorists uh, um, to be released are from Jerusalem. They are uh, um, Israeli Arabs, um, some Israeli citizens, some Israeli residents. These are the people that we've been. Uh, talk about all, all ready since the start of the war, this fear of the, an, look in another, the press, another internal front. And we've said that that's been avoided. Now Now we're going to see a lot of terrorists being released out to the uh, um, but You're calling uh, them to terrorists. The you're calling them terrorists, and we call them terrorists. But in the Arab press, these people that are being released are referred to by the, in the Arabic word of battle, which is uh, a hero. Heroes, without question. They're going to see heroes so, going so out. Heroes and... coming home, uh, you know, a few kilometers from where we are now. They're coming back into the neighborhood. And we've seen these scenes before. We've seen how they're greeted before. So this is also, it's, it's the psychological effect that's going to have on a society that's already pro what Hamas did uh, with this. So, I mean, I would imagine that the police are going to be keeping uh, a very close eye on them. And to see what happens, uh, I don't know if part of the deal was that they cannot be rearrested again. I know it's they, unfortunately, they've been un, 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 unfortunately, uh, unfortunately uh, um, as part of my previous reincarnations or, or previous carnations, uh, um, right, I, 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 I dealt with that extensively. Uh, um, anything that we think could have been a good idea was never implemented. No extra precautions, no extra surveillance, um, and 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 so we just end up with more terrorists going out and killing more people. Um, the statistic as of October 6th was that of the terrorists released for uh, uh, the Gilad Shalit deal, um, more than half Im almost immediately went back to terrorism. That, 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 that was the given. And of those terrorists who went back to terrorism, they have caused the death of 11 people already. Um, that was prior to uh, um, October seventh. Well, there, there's another and, important. We're talking about the psychology. One of the most important principles of psychology is that there's consistency in behavior. People are consistent in what they do, and terrorists are consistent in what they do, even more than regular people, because they have an ideology that they're behind. So the ideology of of the terrorists that we see, the Gazan terrorists and and the Palestinian terrorists and the Hamas terrorists, it's all the same. It's all based on the same principle. So as long as that ideology is intact and is all, you, you're not going to expect anything different than their behavior. And what we've seen before, and we've been through this before, we're going to see again. So this is something that uh, if we haven't prepared before, we really need to prepare for now. And uh, that's in the long term. But in, again, I'll stress again, in the short term, we have to ask ourselves, what is going to happen if we go another day and another day and another day and we go to day 10 without... Uh, without fighting, how are we going to renew this fighting psychologically for our side? And are we going to have the backing of a uh, international community and, after, and, after and, being after with and if, without the scenes? And what happens if Hamas then says, you know what, on day eleven, you know, in two days' time, we'll release another ten people on condition that we extend uh, um, the, the the ceasefire for another four days, another uh, another eight days. But that's what they're Going looking for. They're, not looking, they're not looking for prisoner release. They're looking for the war to end. And you stretch it, you stretch it, you stretch it. So we know that's what they want. The, the question is, are we going to give that to them? The, the, the prisoner release, uh, um, I, I, I think it, it, it's important also for, for our viewers to understand. It's it's an integral part of their, of their strategy, bringing about the release of, of, of terrorists. They then position themselves as, as the heroes. They're the ones who brought about the release of the of, of, of the of the terrorists they were the ones who brought really joy to the families of 
thousands of, of, of Palestinian people, and that is their political gain. By demanding the release of, of, of terrorists, if, if, if I understand their mindset correctly, they still see themselves as surviving to fight another day. Because that, that's why they're asking for the prisoners, because they want to continue enjoying that popular support that comes from being the savior of this group of people. Um, and, 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 and so I think that is probably one of the most dangerous messages that they have for themselves, and that possibly uh, um, in this process maybe feeds into that as well and and, 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 and emboldens that idea that, that they're going to be... Uh, um, uh, you, you've heard every so government they're they're gonna that I've heard have said, this is a deal with the devil. And when Without you deal with the devil, you're, 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 you know, you have bad things that are going to happen. So that's uh, that's the the situation we're having. But you know, again, uh, one person I, who in the intelligence establishment, who his name I won't mention, who was against the Gilad Shalit deal, one of the few people that were really against it in the establishment, uh, is for this deal. And the reason he's for this deal is because it's really, really difficult to say no when you have all those children. Oh. There. So this is that's really that's really the critical this, thing, and this that is, works on our psyche. So this is really my ne my, my my next question for you. In 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 twenty four hours uh, uh, potentially, we're going to see a we're going to see two groups of people in Israel. We're going to see a group of people who are uh, who are enjoying ele really uh, joy without bounds that their loved ones families have been released. Yeah, and then the other group of people who are sitting on and saying, well, what about us? What about our children, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, uh, babies, potentially? Um, and and so, so so how how is that going to affect them? Well, there wasn't unanimity among the among the families in terms of what to do with this deal. There was one group that uh, would be for this, and there was another group that said it's all or nothing. Uh, and the all or nothing group was to avoid exactly what we're seeing now. Yeah. But um, unfortunately, that wasn't a deal that could be reached. And it wouldn't be anything that I would think Hamas would do. Although there is some thinking that if Hamas would have released everybody right now on the condition that it's a permanent ceasefire, um, I wonder what the international community would say at that point and what kind of, and it could be it was a misstep by Hamas not to release everybody. First of all, we don't know if they released 240. That's, that's that's the other that's issue. Exactly the point. So they're, re they're releasing who we know are alive and in relatively good condition that could be released, but we still don't know how many are there and uh, and, and what we have left to trade with. So, but what you're mentioning, um, you know, is absolutely correct. You're going to see uh, this split of of joy versus continued terror. There's going to be families with there are going to be people within their own families that are going to have the split because. Some members of the family are going to return and other members of the family are not. You're going to have children that are going to return without their father. So the family will be split even within them. So um, we really have to wait and see what's going on. Do, 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 Most do. important thing here, uh, uh, General, I think one of the important components of this uh, entire enterprise uh, is that it maintain we maintain some sort of media blackout, if you will, uh, as much as possible uh, with the be, with the returning uh, kidnapped victims because of the fact that being in a free society with a free media uh, is a major risk to the resilience of a society that's fighting, you know, uh, this incarnation of a Nazi regime of ISIS and Al Qaeda all wrapped into one. Everything is a component of psychological warfare of the other side. And as we said in this discussion, their only goal, it's not to save their prisoners, it's not to save their own public, both of which they have conceded many, many years ago, but it's to stay in power, to continue, uh, continue fighting and attempting to uproot and destroy uh, Israel and the Jewish people. And, and, I, and I, so we face really a new reality here that we have not faced in the last 75 years. And, and I think it, it one of the things that we're trying to do with the Jerusalem Center is really refocus uh, our, uh, our uh, analyses and our recommendations on the fact that we are dealing with the cruelest of enemies ever imaginable and that psychological warfare is center stage in everything that goes on opposite this enemy.
But Dan, there's something I think it's very important to to clarify in what you what you said. You're right on, and it's important to clarify for Western ears. Uh, they want to survive not because they want to survive today. They want to survive because they have a lot of ideological patience in terms of their goal of destroying Israel. This is not something that they see in the next year, two years, three years. Although if it happened, they'd be very happy. This is a step toward weakening Israel, weakening the Jewish people by attrition, little by little by little. And if it takes 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, that's okay with them. And that's also part of the philosophy uh, and, and the psyche that you see with, uh, with, with the thinking and the behavior that they do. That is without question. I, I, I think one of, the, uh, um, one of the truly harrowing things that I think you just said, and, 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 and I don't know how Israel is going to deal with that or, or family is going to deal with it, do you believe that there will actually be a situation in which only some members of the family are released and others remain in, in captivity? According to the blueprint, that's exactly what's, what is actually happening. There's children that meet the criteria of being children whose fathers are prisoners as well. So the children could be released, well, the fathers will not. So what we didn't see in, I have to say, in, in any of the, uh, um, in any part of the, the decision of the government was the identity or criteria for those being released, um, for the hostages who are going to be released. They just had, they said they have to be Israeli citizens or residents. They never said whether they were going to be children, elderly, women. That didn't appear to be part of that, or, 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 of that equation, not at least made public so but why would you expect hamas out of the goodness of their heart to keep families together and release them I mean, hamas will continue to be what hamas is so if they have an opportunity to continue to stick uh terror and to try to break apart israeli society they will do that and if, if and part of part of doing that is breaking the families up as well and this uh, uh, um how much do these types of deals really contribute, as you just said, to, to, to really breaking down, to attacking the fabric of Israeli society? This isn't the first time the Palestinians, are, uh, um, uh, uh, until now, before this deal, they, celebra they celebrate 40 different instances in which Israel has released uh, um, prisoners, sometimes um, for some type of a... a, 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 a uh, 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 some type of a game, sometimes uh, uh, just as part of the uh, um, the political processes, whatever they may have been, the Oslo process predominantly, sometimes just as part of a goodwill gesture. All of these, at least until now, Israeli society has managed to, obviously to differing degrees, has managed to really to contain Um do you think that this deal will be different? Even the 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 the, the deal to release Gilad Sharit, one soldier, one thousand and twenty seven terrorists. That took five um, years. That and and that took five years of of also preparing Israeli society. This is much quicker. Do you think that Israeli society will be able to to move on? What is the 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 chos and the 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 internal the strength, the resilience of of Israeli society? Can we move on? Will we move on? I, I would like to, to argue the yes. That's interesting. So I, we had a discussion be, before this discussion, uh, and one of the terms that came up was that, you know, all of Israel is in a trauma. And of course, all of Israel is in a trauma. So I answered uh, that while we're in a trauma, I, I think we have to take a look at it, that we're in a pre-trauma. We know what post-trauma is, but we really don't know what the trauma is that we're going to be in because we're we're not there yet. We've been hit and we've been hit very hard, but this is still ongoing. The trauma, the the stimulus and the the situation, the traumatic situation is still ongoing. Today is a traumatic situation. That that you know, with the goodness of of the hostage release, we realize the the downside of what we're facing ahead. We don't know where we're going to be in a few months from now, and I think that's part of you know, uncertainty. Is always one of the worst things that people face. And there's an uncertainty where we're going. Uh, you know, we, we hear our political leaders talking about ending Hamas, the war will be over when Hamas is gone and finished, and that's the, the strategy. But I would guess that the 
pulse of the public is that not everyone really believes that 100%, that that's actually going to happen. It's something we wish it's going to happen, but I think there's some doubt that that's going to be there. And I think it's important in terms of resilience to take that doubt away, that that's going to Whether be Whether we're, we're going to be able to, I, I think that the question focuses on, on, on two different sides, whether we're going to be able to destroy Hamas's infrastructure, terror infrastructure, and ability uh, um, to implement its governance. I think that... Well, I, technically, we could do it. I, I think that that technically most... Technically, we could do it. Will I we think be most, able... most Israelis believe that we can do. Will the, politically, will we be able Will to we be able to destroy them politically? How do you destroy this idea rather than uh, uh, and something which is tangible? And, and they see Hamas as being an idea as an ideology that's what uh, we're, we're being told all the time and 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 therefore the, there's no hope in destroying uh, uh, so um, I don't, Hamas I don't agree with that thinking I know people are saying that ideologically you, you can't destroy Hamas because it's always there but uh, that's not really accurate because if you take a look at 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 recent ideologies that were horrible ideologies look at the ideology of Nazis the ideology of Nazis after after World War II was a was an ideology that was gotten rid of. Now, of course, there's still Nazis that are around, and there's still neo-Nazi groups. But the the ruling government of Germany and the and the German people today are not Nazis. Uh, the same thing in Japan. Japan had a certain ideology uh, during the war and, and a certain behavior that the Japanese people have that we don't see today. So that's gone. Uh, and in the Middle East, we see the same thing in terms of the, uh, certainly before October 7th, what was going on with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia certainly was not anyone that anyone ever thought uh, could be at peace with Israel. And yet we're, on the, we're still on the brink of peace with uh, or normalization of Saudi Arabia. So there are ways of, of having societies change over time, little by little. The ideology of Islamic uh, jihad is not an ideology that's going to go away. That won't go away. That's definitely not limited only to Hamas. That's part right. of that. The ISIS, uh, that the, 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 the whole axis of evil that's coming from Iran and spreading out that you have to uh, uh, impose Islam over the whole world. Right. But we could create the conditions to reduce the probability that that will be a more frequent ideology. And uh, it's happened through the Abraham Accords. It's happened through the some of the other normalization agreements that we've had. It happened historically, as I said, with Germany and Japan. And uh, certainly socially, it's something that we could we could we could see if we could do again, which is also, you know, we've spoken about this before in terms of what's going to happen the day after uh, in, in Gaza. And that's one of the reasons that um, there needs to be some education of the American administration why the Palestinian Authority in its current structure is someone that doesn't fit that bill because they're very little different. There's, there's not too many differences in terms of their philosophy. There's no between, daylight between, between, them. between them and Hamas. So there has to be a new type of person that's running the Palestinian Authority. We have to look for new partners for peace and uh, not partners for the uh, you know, for the for the mess that we've gotten into over the last. So, so, so one of the questions that we have, uh, just uh, uh, turning to our questions, be uh, um, is it, from uh, Brian Gore. Thank you for uh, for joining us, Brian. And uh, we see your questions regularly, and and we we certainly appreciate them. Um, Brian's asking. I'm just going to change a little bit the question, if I may. Um, Brian's asking. Well, well, how do we deal with uh, uh, going back to war after that initial uh, um, four day, five day a uh, uh, break? What would you suggest would be the messaging, psychological messaging, already now to then continue on? And once it starts up again, how to to almost to re-motivate the forces to say, we stopped, we had a goal, but now we're carrying on full force when obviously the forces are living on adrenaline. Uh, um, I, we all have uh, uh, children uh, uh, um, in the army somehow connected Um I have a few children in the army and, and basically their life is adrenaline and coffee. Um, they sleep four or five hours a day um, at the very best. And, 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 and the forces that are in Gaza at the moment are certainly that. How do we prepare them to, to move on in four days' time? Well, four days is not the problem. I think 10 days is going to be a bigger problem. So four days, you know, it's not that much time. Uh, but, but it's very important in terms of the messages they're getting from the military command. So the military command uh, is saying that from a military point of view, there's, we're not losing much 
if we do a four day ceasefire. There has to be preparation moving south anyway, and we need a break for this and, and what. So they talked about that. I'm more concerned <laughs> it goes beyond the four days to the 10 days. And then uh, the question is, will this ever end? So there, there needs to be a red line that's put out saying, we're giving you up until this point, but we're not allowing you to go past that point. So we know at which point we're going to renew the fighting. Uh, there's problems with that as well, because there's no question that during this period of time, there's re-preparations uh, within Hamas in terms of trying to fight uh, you know, what, they, what they know they're going to expect. Just that drop in adrenaline, also on 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 the side of 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 our forces. Well, there. That's something that uh, you know you know the commanders in the field are really going to have to deal with, and that's again, as I said, the 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 deal brings up more questions than it does answers, and these are one of the questions that 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 come up. And 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 so just to uh, uh, um, wrap up, uh, um, no, uh, uh, um, there isn't any part of this deal, as as far as we know, um, that gives a any type of a, a um, proof of life. We do understand, as as, as Professor Manzoff said, that uh, um, the, uh, there is some type of involvement of the, the International Red Cross. So possibly there will be some information coming on that level. Um, there is no way, uh, uh, Sherry, uh, to, uh, uh, to in answer to your questions, to, to really further track or to we're definitely not putting chips into any of these people. Uh, um, and... Uh, um, that's something which makes it very much more difficult. And the price we pay is always much higher. Um, Israel has always paid many more terrorists for every single person released um, than, than previously. With uh, your permission and, and with Dan's permission, I will leave your last uh, um, question regarding the influence and the involvement of Qatar for an entirely different day. That is a subject to which we really do need to devote an entire session to. It's a complicated question. What is Qatar? Where is Qatar? What's their influence? What are they doing here? Why are they part of this equation? Um, that's really something uh, uh, I believe, Dan, that we need to address uh, um, to a much uh, deeper level. Um, closing mm -hmm. remarks, please, gentlemen. Dan. Uh, first of all, I'd like uh, to thank our audience, which has grown uh, significantly over the 46, 47 days that we have uh, been uh, updating and analyzing, contextualizing uh, these events, unprecedented events in the 75-year history of Israel, and I would argue uh, even well beyond that for the Jewish people. What I would ask our our, our wonderful uh, friends, family, and colleagues from across the seas to send us some feedback. Tell us what uh, what, what is working well for you. What would you like to see in in these briefings? What questions uh, and issues would you like to see answered? And and uh, if uh, you see fit to uh, to give us a testimonial about these uh, these wartime uh, diplomacy briefings, we'd be very happy to have that. Uh, Maurice, you want to offer your? They can send them to you. Uh, uh, was it Maurice at uh, jcpa.org? M a u r i c e. Exactly, m a u r i c e at jcpa.org. That would be great uh, to have them. I, I think that we're, what. Uh, please stay uh, tuned tomorrow. Uh, where we will uh, just have finished the four-hour confab here in Rome, the first ever uh, Rome-Jerusalem emergency summit on anti-Semitism. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, we think, an earth, uh, it's an earth-shattering event, but a path-breaking event in which we will present 10 principles for combating this genocidal anti-Semitism and our intention together with our partners in the in the uh, Italian Senate, is to bring these 10 principles around Europe and into the U.S. Congress and to have them signed uh, and agreed upon by parliaments around the world, particularly in the free world. Uh, and uh, uh, so stay, stay tuned for that. Please join us tomorrow uh, uh, for that. And our focus will increasingly be how do we address this global jihad. And when we talk about jihad, we mean the cheerleading, the energy, uh, the enthusiasm on university campuses across U.S. and European cities for this uh, uh, death cult called Hamas ISIS and their Iranian regime uh, taskmasters and paymasters. So we will be really focusing in our work at the Jerusalem Center on that. So I have to say just uh, uh, on a personal note before before we end, um, one of the hostages is actually the, the son of, of, of friends of ours, um, Hirsch uh, uh, Goldberg Polin, 
um, who was injured as he was uh, uh, as he was kidnapped. Um, Rachel has been, uh, uh, and, and, and John, uh, his parents, have been really running around the world. They're also there in Italy at the moment, I think, meeting with the Pope, Dan. Um, I think Hirsch is just one of the very, very many uh, hostages that we can all just pray that they all come back safely. That's, uh, uh, I think, the, the prayer that we need to I'll have. I agree on that. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, everybody. We will